Ah, nothing warms the heart like an angry mob of loyal supporters baying for the blood of the most successful manager in their club's history. Given this gathering coincided with the second biggest aggregate defeat in Champions League history and followed years of steady decline, one is left to presume that this was the nadir for this once proud club. What needs to change at this club? What do you mean by that? I think this club is in a great shape. Uh... Oh, guess not. Behavior like this has inspired us to remember some of our favorite Gooner moments of the 21st century in a search for meaning and a quest to assign blame. Strap yourself in for a look at everything wrong with Arsenal since 2006. The world was a different place as the curtain rose on the 2006 Premier League season. The UK was in Europe, masks were only worn in Halloween, and Arsenal had the look of a club that knew what they were about. From top to bottom, from fans to physics, everyone was pulling in the same direction. Okay, so they just lost the Champions League final, but there were extenuating circumstances. The irrepressible Thierry Henry had delivered arguably his best performance for the Blaugrana. The only problem was he was still employed at the Arsenal. But none of that mattered. This defeat was a blip, a mere smudge on the lens of a bright future, because the club had just received the keys to its shiny new $140 million, 60,000-seater stadium. An auditorium so advanced, the noise insulation means you can't hear the home fans anywhere inside the premises. And a new era of financial and sporting supremacy was dawning. Except, of course, that it wasn't. The move actually gave rise to monetary constraints so restrictive, Arsene Wenger opened the doors to the Emirates with the words, Curtis Davies I like, I will not be making a bid as high as $10 million. Name an Arsenal fan who wasn't thrilled with that statement. The books had to be balanced. Time was called on the careers of Pires, Vieira, Campbell, Reyes, and Cole. You know, the old guard who were eating up the budget but had nothing left to offer. Except, of course, for the 28 trophies they won after they left. For context, the club had won eight since 2006, and four of those were the Community Shield. They were replaced with the likes of Song, Danielson, and Joe O'Carroll. What do you mean, who? And no, it wasn't that Danielson, although it might as well have been, given the impact his namesake made. These were all signings in the famous Arsene Wenger mold. Young, unknown, cheap, but with stacks of potential. This was now the Arsenal way. And you can complain all you want, but that potential changed the complexion of the Premier League, mainly because most of it moved to Manchester City. Step forward Sanya, Nasri, Toure, Clichy, and Adebayor. Oh, and bona fide club legend Patrick Vieira. And we can't just pass over Emmanuel Adebayor without mentioning that celebration. You know, the one Arsenal fans took on the chin in typically stoic fashion. Hey, at least they know their stadium is more advanced than the Etihad, because we heard them just fine that day. We would be remiss to suggest that all Arsenal's problems stemmed from the fact that they were too hard up to sign established players. Haha, <laughs> they're not getting off that easy. They were too stubborn and scared as well. Those big names can affect the dressing room, you know. Yes, replied every other winning club. That's why we do it. Arsene did, and only on occasion, find the funds to appease those angry fans. Sadly, it all felt a bit half-baked and the results followed suit. We'll skip past the likes of Silvestra and Mertesaka because, well, everyone else did, and take a look at a few that really made a difference, like William Gallus, who arrived in a deal inspired by children trading football stickers in a playground. I'll swap my Ashley Cole for your William Gallus and five starbursts kind of thing. Now, say what you like about the Frenchman, but there was a player you wouldn't find sitting around when the chips were down. Right, okay, I suppose there was that time when the Gunners imploded against Birmingham in 2008 and he... Right, yeah, he literally sat down on the pitch for ages. Ooh, but what about Kim Schalstrom? Hey, if football managers said you were good, then who are we to argue? Sadly, Kim never got a chance to break the back of the Premier League, mainly because he arrived with a broken back of his own. Mesut Azil. He signed from Real Madrid, for goodness sake. Oh, but no, that didn't work out either. Begs the question, do you have a right to feel aggrieved when you break the bank for a player Sir Alex Ferguson nicknamed the Ghost and he doesn't turn up? If the theme of ineffective leadership is starting to emerge, then guilty as charged. This was never more evident than in the players the management tried to sign, but due to a total absence of affirmative action, couldn't. Like Fulham's Mark Schwarzer, who at $5 million was deemed too expensive. Even though the alternative was Manuel Chris Packethands Almunia. 
Arsenal simply repeated the word two until the cottager stopped answering the phone. There was also the Luis Suarez saga. Not only did the club meet his release clause, they added an extra quid on top. This lame attempt was met with a very public no from Liverpool's American owner, who famously asked, what do you think they're smoking over there at the Emirates? If they wanted the answer to that, he should have texted Wojciech Stensnik. A man blessed with such sporting intelligence, he celebrated a 2-0 defeat to Southampton on New Year's Day 2015 by sparking up in the showers. If JW is still curious, he could direct that question to Jack, anyone got a light? Wilshire, who, like the smell of stale cigarettes, is still hanging around. All right, maybe we shouldn't tease. Maybe Arsenal's woes in the transfer market are just the result of an aversion to big numbers. The trouble with that assessment is the stagnating recruitment policy and the culture it fostered meant they recorded plenty of them over the years. There was that 8-2 game against a mid-table team in Manchester, a 5-1 defeat to Martin Skrtel, a 4-4 loss to Newcastle, a 4-4 surrender to Academy graduate David Bentley's goal kick, a 10-2 aggregate exit to Bayern, and a 6-0 thrashing at the hands of Jose Mourinho on Arsene's 1,000th game. No, that's it. We've heard enough. There's one common denominator in all of this, and it's the gaffer. Poor decisions, bad guys, shocking results, Wenger out. And eventually, the cry was heated. Problem solved? You're joking, right? North London let out a collective sigh of relief when the board finally ended the Frenchman's 22-year reign. But the fans were wasting their breath. Turns out the problem was bigger than him all along. In came Unai Emery in an appointment so protracted it made a visit to your doctor during the pandemic look fast-tracked. Fans sang, we got our arsenal back. And they were right, because fuzzy thinking, inconsistency, and unrest has endured. Emery oversaw the best ever start to a managerial career at Arsenal and the club's worst run in 30 years, which is a record as impressive as it is baffling given he only lasted 18 months. But look, the guy had insight. He told the club to sign Zaha instead of $72 million Pepe, who we think is still employed at Arsenal. By recruiting Baird Leno, he recognized that Petr Cech's snack for winning games lay with Chelsea. Shame only that he started the check against them in the Europa League final and was proved correct. Hey, it's not like a player they deemed surplus to requirements made them regret. Wait, says here Giroud opened the scoring in a 4-1 demolition. Oh, that's too bad. No, the long-suffering fans were right. Emery had to go as well. He'd missed out on top four and lost the final. No bueno. What was needed was a new broom, thinking so fresh it hadn't even formed yet. Enter Mikel Arteta, a manager yet to take charge of a senior game. Has the turbulence under his reign been entirely predictable? Well, maybe not, but it's hardly a shocker. To be fair, it's not been a total disaster. There was that FA Cup win, and... That was good. For all the dodgy results and outcry from former players, there appears to be some light at the end of the tunnel for the Spaniards' young side. All that remains to be seen is whether they move towards it or collapse in the now customary Arsenal fashion. So that's a brief run through everything wrong with Arsenal since 2006. But there are still two questions worth asking. A. Is the decline over? B. Who's responsible? As for the first, we're optimistic. The current crop is forging an identity and the competition isn't crazy hot. As for the blame game, well, it's probably layered. Could Arsenal have foreseen the emergence of Chelsea when they signed for the bank loan? Were petrodollars going to make it mission impossible regardless? Or is it just as simple as a chronic failure of leadership that seeped down from boardroom to changing room and which compounded over time? Go on, take your thoughts to the comments section. And remember, could be worse, could be Spurs. All this talk of Arsenal antics got you hungry for more? Check out this video on the six players rejected by Arsenal for ridiculous reasons. And the hits just keep on coming!